it going? So this morning, before we begin, you may have seen a post on Piazza um, about the Tufts Engineering Mentors. Uh, uh, Hyung here is from the Tufts Engineering Mentors, and he wanted to give you like a quick spiel on it so that he could get some feedback maybe on, um, on doing the mentoring. Now, this is not for, it's not just for engineering students. It's also for uh, arts and sciences students as well. Uh, but he's going to talk a little bit about that. And then there is a survey online if you get the chance. Uh, could, you know, you're not busy doing anything else these days, I'm sure. Um, if you get the chance over the next, uh, next couple of days to fill it out, he'd probably he'd appreciate that. So over to you, Young. You just said everything I need to say. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to just quickly tell you guys about uh, mentors. We're a fairly new group. And what we do is we essentially pair up underclassmen and upperclassmen into mentor and mentee pairs. Um, our aim is to really harness the mental experience and knowledge to provide guidance to the underclassmen that's just that's, not, that's actually beyond just academics, right? So we go into areas of employment, internship, how to make a how to like write a cover letter, make your resume more competitive. And on top of that, we also organize events, like several mental events, um, to give you a nice we invite speakers from the industry like in academia to um, to give you another flavor of what the university is really about. For example, tonight we're inviting the CEO and inventor of ID Paint. And ID Paint, you know what, if you don't know what that is, it's paint that turns any surface into a whiteboard. Uh, so that's pretty cool. That's kind of like seven in tablets. So if you're interested, you should come to that. And so if you're interested in being a mentor, maybe you'll be a rising junior, rising senior, um, or if you're interested in being a mentee, maybe you'll be a rising sophomore. Um, I would really appreciate it. Uh, the survey that was posted on Piazza. That's literally it. Any questions? No? Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. So let's see. Here's what we're going to do today. Um, so I, I had promised this last week that I was going to do a uh, kind of a Comp 40 preview slash what you should start to think about if you're doing that. Uh, for those of you who, who are not taking Comp 40 next year or ever in your career, <laughs> right? You you do not have to like stay if you don't want to. I will not be upset if you like get up and leave. But um, but I think it's interesting stuff about Comp about the types of things you'll learn in Comp 40, and maybe you'll be interested in it. Who knows? Uh, we we can also talk a little bit about the project still if you want. Um, as hopefully you've seen at this point, the project's been extended to next Tuesday. Uh, and hopefully that uh, helps out a little bit. And let's see what else. Oh, uh, in the next couple days, hopefully today actually, you'll get an email from uh, your, either your lab TAs or some other TA talking about the in-person grading for comp or for assignment four. That was the sorting one. You have to go and you kind of describe what your algorithms are and they show you how you did and it's all the in-person stuff. I'm sorry it's taken this long to get around to, to, uh, to that point, but we'll, uh, We'll, we'll do that. It's only going to take 20 minutes per person or 25 minutes per person tops to like go through it and, and get your grade, and you'll have instant grade at that point. So we just have to sign everybody up, and that can take a little bit of time. But we'll we'll do that, uh, and so you won't. It hopefully, will not go into reading period because I know that's kind of a sacred time. So uh, we'll uh, we'll do that. Uh, let's see. Any questions before we begin on homework five or anything else? No. The people I've talked to, and I've probably talked to about 85% of you at this point, uh, have been doing, have been have have had some very good ideas and have been doing great on it. Uh, and there's um, this is a hard project. So just so you know, this is like not a trivial type of project. And I didn't give you as many as much scaffolding as before. So good job, um, very good thinking going on there. So I'm I'm happy to see that. All right. Yes. Question. Um, wait, is there any line limit? Well, yeah. so here. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce says yes. I say we will, if you're 31 or 32, I'm not going to stress too much about it. Um, here's the, you know, we've given you a function, the read line, or read, read lyrics, I guess it is. I think that's already over 30 or something close anyway. So, I mean, you know, we do have to, we do have to uphold some of our own rules, I suppose. But if, if, you, if you justify it by, oh, I needed to do this and it didn't make sense to put it in another function and I was, you know, that's fine. But Bruce says yes, so. It does help you debug your program. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I'll reiterate this for the camera, but Bruce brings up a good point. I mean, if your functions are more than 31 lines, they're probably too long. I mean, that, that you, you, if you have a bug and you come to me and say, hey, I can't figure this out, and your program's this long, it's, doesn't, you've done something wrong to begin with. I mean, I guess that's kind of the issue. You, you probably should break it up. And then once you break it up, as Bruce says, once you break it up, you will find very quickly that you find your problems. Like, you can narrow them down easier, and you can find them. So, yeah. Any other comments? Yes? What's the best way to see how much like, memory? Ah, good question. What, what's the best way to see how much memory you're using? So there is a slash user slash bin slash time dash lowercase v, I believe, will give you, uh, and then you run your program using that. It will give you all the statistics about the uh, am total amount of memory you're using at a given time. It like counts up, and then if it goes down again, it still gives you the maximum. Um, there's a Piazza post about exactly how to use that. Uh, you could also run it through Valgrind. The problem with Valgrind is it's so slow for the huge data sets, you're just not going to uh, do that. Oh, by the way, and I don't know if I talked to you about this, Bruce. Bruce mentioned the time thing. It looks like the number that the time gives you for the memory is off by a factor of four. So it will say a number that is four times bigger than the actual memory you're using. That was after I, I put it through a couple different programs and found that I was differing. And then I looked online, and somebody said, oh, yeah, it's a bug in the time function. So that's the way it goes. I don't know why they haven't fixed it yet. In fact, it's open source. I should just probably go fix it. <laughs> so anyway, um, maybe that'll be my project over, over summer. Go fix that one line bug <laughs> in time and try to get it pushed back into the Linux repository. That would be the tough part. Uh, OK, other questions? Yes? Is there a way to iterate through a map? Is there a way to iterate through a map? There is a way to iterate through a map. Um, you, you just set up an iterator and do the plus plus like you normally would. I would caution you that that is not the normal way to go through a map, certainly. Um, if you, I, had, I sometimes do that when I'm deleting things that are being pointed to at the end in a destructor. I'll do that. But otherwise, if you find yourself iterating through a map, you're probably, unless you're doing something a little esoteric, you're probably doing something not geared towards what a map is made for, which is hashing to you know, key versus value. But there is a way to do it. You can do it, yes. Yeah. Anything else? No? OK. So let's talk about a little bit about this, this idea of Comp40 and what Comp40 is all about. Hey, we're going we're gonna to talk about all these little things. And here's the, here's the goal of today. <laughs> Everybody's scramming. Here's, <laughs> see you guys later. <laughs> Have fun not taking Comp40. Um, for the rest of you, you will, I think you will, you, will, uh, you will like Comp40. In the end, you'll be glad you did it. So here's, here's the, the bottom line on Comp40, OK? It's, it's a hard course because there's a lot of, a lot of very like, intense programming. Okay? There's a lot of intense programming. And you will, as the course website today says, you will actually turn the corner from being an introductory programmer, which is what we're trying to get you just to the edge of that with this current program. Like you are, after you get done with the song search, you will have gotten to this point where you're slightly past that introductory programming level. OK? And we're trying to get that to working as a professional. Now, what does that mean? Well, you'll find all this out on like, the first day of class. But what it really means is you do a lot of programming with very stringent requirements. right? If your program seg faults, for instance, if you, if you provide a program and they come up with some testing and the program seg faults, you get a 0 for the assignment. No questions asked. They just say, sorry, it seg faulted. We gave you an input that seg faulted. Your program crashed. And you get a 0 for the assignment. And that's the end of it. Right? Because they want you to be very cognizant of checking for everything. So we've been less likely to give you like poor grids because of that in this class. So you just have to be aware of that sort of thing. Not that that should scare you. It's just, you know, it's kind of part of the, part of the deal of it. The idea of Comp40 is it's a computer architecture class and a systems class. And what that really means is you're going to get to know all these different things on how computer, the hardware works, operating systems, the compilers, like how does a compiler work? You do a little bit of that. Uh, how the actual runtime like runs your program and what's going on underneath the covers, right? So a lot of what we've done this semester is don't look under the covers. Kind of let let a lot of other things do do that work for you. Like for instance, using a string class, or for for that matter, the vector class that I gave you the other day was saying here's like an uh, here's a way to use dynamic arrays where you don't have to muck around in the expanding and all that, right? Well, 
Comp 40 kind of goes the other direction. They say, we, we want you to muck around in it. And we really want you to dig deep into this stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see. So you're going to write a bunch of this low level C. And we'll get into the details of that in, in uh, like what's, what the differences are that you should probably look at over the summer. And, and this is kind of my, my overall like, desire for you to go forward with this. Take whatever you want out of this lecture, but go look at the reference materials over the summer and like, dig into them because there's a lot going on there. You're going to write C. You're going to write assembly code, which is like the machine language. I showed you one machine language program way back at the beginning of the semester and, and uh, when we were talking about asymptotic notation and said it was ugly. Well, it is kind of ugly. But it's, it's also beautiful in its, in its own way. Okay? Uh, you'll have programming partners. So here's the biggest thing about Comp40. You, you will be paired with a different person for every assignment. Okay? And every assignment will be, uh, you'll have a different partner. Didn't I just say it? You'll have a different partner for each assignment, and you'll be working together. In other words, you have, to, you have to do both your, like you have to figure your schedules out so that you work together. What's cool about pair programming is two minds working on one project tends to get it done a little bit more efficiently in general, and you can, you can bounce ideas off of each other, and you learn from everybody, and you also meet a lot of new friends, so that's good too. Uh, you're going to have to do lots of design documents. So the, the first assignment you've got, you're going to have the same sort of thing we did here, except more fleshed out design documents. And there's going to be a lot of reading. So this summer, go do your reading on this stuff. Okay? All right. C to C++. Let's talk about this for a second. So where did the C language come from? We've talked about C++, which is this language that's got all these objects, and it's a big, huge, gigantic language, and there's tons of things going on. C, obviously, is the, what C++ came from. And it was developed in the late 60s, early 70s. AT&T Bell Labs, like amazing research, research lab at that point in time. It's gone down a little bit these days, but it's amazing. This guy named Dennis Ritchie, uh, like brilliant dude, worked on this programming language and said, here's what I want it to do. I want it to be able to do systems level without doing assembly language, which means it's got things like for loops, and it's got things like while structures, and, and it's got um, if statements and all that, the things that don't that are harder to deal with in a low-level assembly language. Okay? It was designed for Unix. Like Unix was kind of designed along with this. So that's one of the reasons we use C so much in the Unix world is because they were designed together. So they're, they're, they're very nice. And the other nice thing is it was designed to be what we call close to metal, which means that C is like really you get down into the weeds, which we'll, we'll go into a little bit of the details here, which I think is kind of fun. I mean, if you, if you like that stuff, you like really get to know what's going on under the, under the hood of your PC. Okay? All right. Another thing about C, it's like really often used, right? Here's the, this is, this is, the, this is a list, you can get this online, tob.com, where it lists all the different programming languages, and they kind of make this metric of how frequently it's used in, in practice, right? And C has been at the top for pretty much forever. Java has, has switched, switched with it occasionally, because Java became really important like about 10 years ago. 10 or 15 years ago. But C was, has always been the top two. This is a really interesting one. Anybody have an iPhone? If you have an iPhone, Objective C is what you use to program iPhones. That's actually more frequently used these days than C, which, is, which boggles me because it's, a, it's just amazing how much the iPhone and iPad have like, turned programmers into a different programming language. Right? Some other ones in here. Uh, Python's a big one that we use. JavaScript is used for web stuff. But C, look, C is like the language, right? Here's another little graph on this. This is the C. So Java was a bit for ahead, but this, this line here is C. It's always been one or two in the, in the uh, frequency of most widely used programming languages. Okay? This also might, you might at some point want to learn Java too, just because that's another pretty bit highly used, uh, frequently used one. C++ is this one, I believe, kind of, you know, nah, not so great. It's going down a little bit, but it's, it's uh, still used a lot. But other languages have eclipsed it in terms of for certain certain uh, uses. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then I think this one down here is Objective C, which zoop, straight up. There. This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. This slide right here. Go to the Comp40 website, look at the reference material, and start like reading this stuff. Okay. If you come in on day one ready to go, you will make your life 10 times easier by the time you get to uh, like the first project. Right? You gotta, there's a bunch of readings. There's a bunch of coding standards. 
you know, our coding standards, okay, no 31 line, no function more than 31 lines or 80 columns. This says, look, you're going to have eight character tab spaces. You're going to put your func declare your functions as follows. You're always going to declare x, y, and z. So there's a lot of coding standards you're going to need to know. You're going to get up to speed on that pretty quickly. But like the first couple weeks of class next semester, you want to already have this stuff in the bag. Okay. Uh, what happens when you compile a C program? Cool. This whirlwind tour of C, I'm going to give you a little bit of that today. But this is another really good one to say, what's the difference between C and C++? Okay. How do you use this stuff? Well, go to these web pages. Look at this stuff, and then if you have some time, maybe try to redo, say, our song search, which will be perfect by the time you get out of here next week, right? When you get to redo that in C, and you will find out that there are no vector, there are no strings, there are no, you have to deal with all this stuff on your own. And it, just, just doing that is, uh, and there is no new keyword in C, right? So you have to deal with that, and if you reprogram your stuff so that it is in C, you'll find out, you'll, you'll have to grapple with these things. You might as well do it now then when you're actually in class. Projects come one after the other in Comp 40. They're like boom, 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 right? And there's like 10 of them. So you have to, you have to like keep on top of it. All right. Uh, by the way, did anybody get on the wait list that should not have been in Comp 40? You guys are all enrolled if you're doing it next semester. You're on the wait list? I, if you're a Comp Sci major, we'll be OK. Other, I'm a minor. Oh, you're a minor? OK, you should be, you should be fine. OK, but anyway, go to this web page right now. Hopefully, they won't take it down over the summer. If they do, I'll, I'll make them put it back up. Okay, email me if they do. All right. So, this I, you know C was supposed to be an assembly language like replacement, right? It says C has the speed and efficiency of assembly language combined with the readability of assembly language, right? It's not the most readable thing, but you guys are all dealt with that because of C, uh, because of C plus plus. Like you kind of already know a lot of that. Uh, you'll find a lot of it to be similar. It's because it's based on C plus plus is based on C. It's very similar. That cause can cause some problems where you just all of a sudden are like. Wait, this should work this way. Oh, it doesn't. C is a little different. OK, we'll get into some of the things. Here's the things that are the same. You've got ints and car chars and floats and doubles and all those things. Right? You also can use bracket notation for arrays. You don't that much, as it turns out. You don't quite as often, but you can. Function declarations are the same. You need voids and you need ints and all that, you know, the return types and all that. You do have .h files. You have .c files instead of .cpp files. But they're the same idea. You have a .h file and a .c file. Uh, and then you have the same control flow, ifs, whiles, all that. Okay? Very similar in that sense, which is great. However, there are some things that are different. There is no string type. I'm going to hammer this again in another slide. Uh, strings are just null terminated arrays of characters. Array, 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 or character, 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 zero. That's a string. Right? If you forget to put that null at the end of your string, you'll have a buffer overflow, and your program will crash, and it gets ugly, or you'll just it, it won't uh, it, it will not be fun. So you got to remember that. Uh, no classes, no objects, no constructors, destructors. Everything's a function. You just have functions. You have structs, which is how you keep the, keep your information. You cannot put functions inside of structs. Structs you can put function pointers, but you may get into that. But it's just basically variables, and that's it inside your pointers or other structs, or inside your structs. Okay. Uh, memory management, no new. You do not do a new because there's no objects. What you use is this thing called malloc, which is memory allocation. Okay. You can do that in C++ too. We use new normally. Uh, you have to provide the size of the amount of bytes you need. Whoa, that's a little weird. Not just the size of the array, it's the size of the total number of bytes that you need to do. And, a, and remember, a byte is like the way a computer says, this is the, the, this is the minimum number I'm going to deal with is a byte-sized, eight bits of data. Okay? I'll show you some examples of this. To free memory, you use free. You don't use delete. You do not need to give it any, any size. It already knows. If you've, used, if you've already ma malloced it, it will know how to free it on its own. Uh, you can't pass by reference. There's no reference types. Everything's either a pointer or a standard variable. You can pass structures like you normally would. There is no Boolean type. What? No Boolean type, right? How do you do true and false? Zero is false. Everything else is true. <laughs> Basically the way it is. You're, you, when you do uh, comparisons for some of the uh, Boolean comparisons that, that we actually uh, well, if you do like and, and, and ampersand, ampersand, and that sort of thing, You'll get 0 and you'll get 1 for being true. But in C and C++, 0 means false, 27 means true, negative 5 means true, whatever. If it's 0, it's false. That's really the only consideration. Yeah? 
There is not a variable that has a bit in it, no. You can, uh, you can get around it a little in, in certain ways. Um, I was going to say a little bit. You can get around it uh, in certain ways by declaring, uh, uh, what are they called? Unions, I guess, and some other things where you can do bit level things. But the computer itself, you can't tell the computer go to an address based on the bit. You can only do it by byte. So that's really why they, they, don't, they don't worry about it in that case. You will do lots of bit stuff. In, in Comp40, but it's going to be on bytes. You'll to look at individual bits in a byte. You'll learn all about that in C. I'm not going to try to teach you all of like 40 right now, <laughs> but that's that. OK, questions on that, the things that are different. We'll go also over some of the details here in a minute. Okay. Here's some of the details. No terminated char arrays. I will repeat, no terminated char arrays, right? Here's, you, you have to be careful in these arrays because there is no checking for you. Like C is like, here's the computer, do what you'd like with it. All right, to a, to a first order. These days, the operating system says, you get this chunk of memory, and I'm going to manage it all so you can't screw up somebody else's program. That's generally what happens. But within your program, you get access to all your memory locations. You could go right over everything and be done with it, right? You could, you could screw it up pretty easily. You have to make sure that you keep the, like the, your strings inside the size of the array. Can you, do dyna- can you do dynamic arrays? Of course you can. right? Oops, It's going to be a little different. You're going to use malloc instead of new, but you can do dynamic arrays. But if you ask somebody, type in a string for me, you'd better check that the buffer you're putting that string into is big enough to hold it. Right? That's a C thing. You've got to make sure that that's true. Okay? So for instance, here, we use this f gets instead of like C in. And by the way, there's no operator overloading either. What you get is what you get. You don't like you can't rechange what equals means or what plus means, right? Um, you can do in this case, f get says give me 26 bytes of data, and that's it. If you happen to turn do the do the string and then put a return like a new line on it, that counts as one of your characters in general. Sometimes you have to take that away. So little stuff like that, that you're going to have to think about. Okay, you can see uh, I don't think I put this one online, but you can copy this one pretty straight, pretty. Closely. Uh, by the way, you have to put the dot h on your little uh, includes too. You have to remember that. These are things you will figure out on like day one if you don't do it. Okay. There's a whole. This is kind of small, but there's a whole bunch of string functions. There are. There's a string library to deal with these character strings. Okay. Uh, string compare. St- uh, string cat. Combine two strings together. You got to be really careful. If you t- say take these two strings and put them in this other string. Right? Well, that other string better be big enough to hold those two strings. Otherwise, it'll buffer overflow, and then you'll crash your program. You've got to think about those things in C. Okay? String copy, same thing. You can, you can copy two strings. Again, you have to worry about, is there enough room in the buffer that I'm copying to? String length, you can talk about how long it is. How, how does, a, how does the, a C program get the length of a string? It says, character, 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 zero, stop counting. That's how it does it, right? It just counts up the number of characters. There is no other function that's in the background that says, how long is this string? If you want the string length, it goes count, 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 count. Here's the string value, the length. Okay? Low level stuff. This is low level stuff. Okay, questions on strings? I'm kind of flying through a lot of this stuff because there's, there's other stuff I want to I wanna get to, but th- this will all be online so you can drag it down and look at it as well. Okay? All right. Here's some more differences. Structs are slightly different. You know how in C++ you can say struct, and then you do the name, and then, and then when you want to use it, you just say the name of my struct and then the variable name. In C, you can't do that. You have to actually say struct, I'm giving you a struct, and then give the, the variable name. It's, it's a little thing. What people normally do is they type def the name of their structure. right? And they, they do it like this. They, you, can, you do a type def, you call struct, calling it that name, and then you say, look, my struct is going to be called struct name t, and it is a struct of string name blah, blah, blah. So it's easy to deal with. You just have to know that you'll see structs being a little different in C. No big deal on that, though. Okay. Again, if you're writing this down, this, will, this is all on the, on the slides online. Okay. All right. So there are some things that we haven't talked about that are the same about C and C++. Maybe you've seen them before when you've dealt with C, but there are these things called void pointers. Void pointers say, 
you know what, right now I don't know what the type of my pointer is going to be. I don't know that it's going to be an int or a char or, a, or a, you know, something else or a float or whatever. You don't know. So what you can do is you can say, for now, make it a void pointer and I'll eventually figure it out. When is that a good thing? When you're trying to allocate memory to say, this is a character pointer, right? And you're trying to allocate memory for it. Malloc has no idea what you're trying to allocate it for until you tell it. And it just says, here's a bunch of bytes. And then you have to do what we call casting, which says, hey, take that value. And if it's a void pointer, it's now going to be this kind of pointer. That's what it does. This is in C and C++. By casting, you'll do a lot of casting. Casting says, here's a type, here's another type. I know that you might, the compiler might not like these two types being different, but I know what I'm doing. I'll, I, I'm going to convert one to the other and, and let you do the conversion for me. It's a little tricky, but it works. We've used that some, in some cases for some of the stuff that's a little more advanced in 40. Here's another one that I, I don't like very much. You can use the slash less for your comments. I don't think they let you do that in comp 40. In other words, you have to use the slash star and star slash to block in comments. You can't do the slash slash. Why? Well, it kind of goes back to the fact that originally C didn't even have those comments. Some people think it makes it those comments, the slash slash comments are a little harder to understand. I don't exactly know why, but that's the that's you know, they, they won't let you do that. So a couple things there. Okay. All right, a couple more things on this. Malloc. So here's how malloc works. Malloc, you say to malloc, and it means memory allocation, like give me a chunk of memory big enough for me to hold what I want to hold. Right? So, they say, so you say, uh, just give me some memory from the heap, and it says, how much do you want? Here's a pointer to that memory. That's it. Right? Malloc doesn't really care what t the type is, which is why it's a void pointer type. But what you do is you have to give it the number of bytes. How do you know how many bytes things have? Well, there's this thing called size of. Size of int actually returns the sod how many bytes that integer takes, which is kind of cool. Turns out on our machines, an int is generally four bytes or 32 bits long, but four eight bit bytes is how many it is. So when you ask for, if you went to malloc one byte of memory or one int worth of memory, right? You have to ask for four bytes worth. How do you do that? You say size of int and do it. I'll show you an example in a sec. Okay, that's how you actually get the memory. Which is kind of cool. This size of works on anything. It can work on structs. It'll work on the compiler figures, figures it all out. It works on structs. It works on uh, all the different types. And so it gives you how much memory that individual piece is going to take. Kind of nice. Here's how it works. Uh, let's see. You need to cast it to the type you're asking for. So here's an example. Here's, I'm, I want an array of 10 integers from the heap. Well, I say I need an int pointer to store that, the pointer to that memory. And I say the int pointer equals, I'm casting it, and I'm saying give me an int pointer back. That makes sense. malloc, the size of an int, times 10. And that will give me 40 bytes worth of space. How does it know 40? Because it knows that an integer is 4. So it does 4 times 10. It gives you 40 back. And it says, if you point to this location that I give you, you'll get 40 bytes that are yours for the rest of your program. Woohoo. Right? That's that. Yeah. This is not operator overloading. This is, this is casting to a different type. And it's saying, malloc returns a void pointer, but I know it's an int pointer, so I'm going to say, give me an int pointer. And you actually have to do that, or the compiler will complain. Okay. You will probably use GCC, not Clang, um, but if you, you know, you might get away with losing Clang if you're if you're nice. They, 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 I doubt they'll let you, but you never know. Uh, if you run out of memory, this will be a null pointer, so you should check that, right? If you run out of memory, you should always check that. I'm I'm ignoring that here just for for uh, simplicity's sake, but definitely check that because you could run out of memory in some circumstances. Okay, that's how malloc works. Woohoo! Let's see, free. It's just like delete, except for straight up pointers. It's actually very similar. You don't need to worry about brackets or anything like that. You just say, look, I asked for this pointer before. I don't need it anymore. You can have it back, memory system. Free the pointer. Right? Don't do that. Don't try to then use that memory once you've freed it. You will, you will crash your program. Simple stuff in that case. All right. All right, so now we're going to dig into some of the examples here. 
here's your program. Notice that I used the, the block style comments here. Right? OK, we've got an int pointer. We've got an int pointer that's asking for 40 bytes of, of memory. I'm then going to take the int pointer, and I'm going to say for i equals 0, i is less than 10, because I'm only asking for 10 spaces, i plus plus star int pointer plus i equals i times 10. Mm. Got to think about what that means for a, mi a minute there, right? Okay. And then I say, I'm going to go through five of them in some interesting fashion and print them out. What do you mean print, print f? What is this all about? Right? That's the way you do a printing out to the standard output like C out. Right? There is no C out in C, in C. There's only this, well, there's a couple of things, but print f is the one you're probably going to use. Okay? Print f, which we'll jump into in a sec, we're kind of going, going to go into print f land for a sec, is it takes a, a little string with some format characters in there. The format characters are percent signs. Have you guys used that before, printf? Some of you have. Some of you have not. OK. And then, it gives, and then you have a bunch of arguments after it. And those arguments are then plugged into their respective places given the formatting argument. And that's how it prints out what you want. So the question is, what's this print out? Well, let's talk about a little more detail about printf. All right, printf. I just told you exactly what this does. But this is, this is to print out the number 22, which happens to be in the i variable. Here's what you do. You say printf. This is i colon percent %d. d is the, format, the formatter for an, a 32-bit integer, right? or whatever the int type is for your system. Okay? You can also use, I believe, i. But d, decimal value maybe, I don't, know what it, I don't exactly know what it stands for. It's not decimal value. I'm not sure what it stands for. But anyway, the output is just this. This is i colon, and then it fills in the value of i. Not too bad. You can put lot, any number of these in the string you want. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Questions on that? I'll go to the, I'll, here's some more examples. <laughs> here's all the different, for, some of the different format strings. All these guys. If you want to print out an octal number in base 8, you use percent %o. If you want to do a hexadecimal number, percent %x. If you want to do an unsigned hexadecimal uppercase, you do percent uppercase %x. And it actually prints out the little x for you. I'll show you that in a minute. Floating points you can do. Uh, scientific notation, it will do that. Uh, let's see, more hexadecimal floating point. You don't want to get into hexadecimal floating point. You can tell, I can tell you that right now. Character. If you want to print out a character, it's percent %c. If you want to print out a string, which is those C strings, it's percent %s. If you want to print out the pointer value, you'll do this a lot when you're like, what is going on in my program? Print out the pointer, pointer address, and it'll do that for you. Okay? And there's lots of other. If you want to print a percent, you have to do percent percent, because then it does. Yeah. But Sam. Good question. If you choose the wrong one, uh, the compiler will generally yell at you. It's normally just a warning, because it goes, ah, let's see, you know what you're doing. Normally just a warning. Um, but sometimes it does, it'll print garbage if you don't do the right one. Uh, Clang is very good about saying, did you mean this one? <laughs> right? If uh, G plus, GCC is not so good about that. But that's, that's the difference. That's what will happen. OK. So here's some more printf examples. Let's see what these ones would do. And I'll, I'll go through each one individually. And, and you don't need to know all these, but if you want, look on the previous chart and you'll see what they are. If you want to print a character, percent %c, percent %c, and you have the character a, well, hopefully it'll just print a, or the character 65, which happens to map to uppercase a, that will print characters colon a a, like that. Straightforward stuff, right? If you want to do decimal numbers, right? I guess that is what D stands for, according to this anyway. D is uh, decimal. Uh, LD means if you have a long, which is like eight bytes generally. OK, we'll print that. It, just, it doesn't look any different. In fact, that could, it, that could be just a regular integer. But that's just print size, like that. There's the other formatting ways. You percent and then 10 and then decimal. It will print 10 uh, blank spaces before the 1977, like that. Yeah. Zeros, you can pad it with zeros as well if you want to do that. Sometimes we, we might want to do that. Radices, if you want to do hexadecimal or binary or, well, I don't know if it does binary, but hexadecimal or octal or whatever, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. That's 100 in decimal is 100. 100 in hex is 64. 100 in octal is 144. In hex with the cool little, to tell you it's a hex variable, 0x, et cetera. Okay? 
You can just do this. You, you do not have to stress about these right now. You'll just know how to use them eventually. Floating points, lots of different ways to do floating points. Percent 4.2F right, of 3.1416 says, give me, let's see, it says, give me two decimal places on the right hand side and four on the left, which I guess there's only one, so I think that's what it means. So 3.14 would truncate it right there. Uh, and there's other different ways of printing it. This is exponential notation and so forth. Right? You can print, like if you do star D, it will give you like a number of, it'll say, just give me, uh, I don't know how many it is there. How many, no, five spaces. It'll do that, right? It'll give you five spaces there. Kind of a little trick. If you want to print strings, it's percent %s and then the string. Okay? There is no end L. You're always going to use backslash n for your ending uh, new lines. Okay? Question, yeah, that's not. Very good point. Some, somebody posted this on Piazza. They were getting some mistakes with the formatting of times at one point. Because they were putting in like 0144 would mean uh, 0144, and they thought it was 144 AM. The 0 says this is an octal number, which I don't know why they did it that way, but they did. So if you type a 0144, that means, hey, this is an octal number, and the compiler will treat it that way. So you've got to be careful there. You probably won't do octal numbers often in, this, in Comp40. You may. I don't know. Did you take Comp40? That's on? No. OK. All right. Anyway, that's printf. So let's go back to what this is going to print. Anybody figure out what this is going to print? First of all, what's getting stored here? What's getting stored at each value of the, of the uh, pointer array? i times 10 from 0 to 10. So what's getting stored? Yeah, David. A factor of 10. So the first one's going to be 0, and then 10, and then 20, and then 30, and then 40, right? So that's what's going to be in memory. OK. So that's doing that. And this says the int pointer plus the, vari plus the variable we're using, that integer, say, go to that location and, get, and put into it, it gets i times 10. Okay? It's pointer arithmetic, right? You can add to a pointer, and the compiler says, oh, I'll go to the next location where that number should fit. I'm going to, show, I'm going to dig into the details a little in a second and show you what that means. What does this print out then? 0 to 5 prints out a decimal number for star int pointer plus i times 2. What's going to get printed out for this loop? It'll skip. So what's it going to print? It'll print 0, then 20, then 40, then 60, then 80. I believe you're right, because it's going to say i times 2 is going to be 0. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Well, actually, 9 or 8. And then it'll do the pointer there plus that value, so it's going to jump. So there you go. Okay, question, Eliza. So int pointer plus whatever is 10 is like, would be our version of the, the array brackets? Array brackets, yeah. You can rewrite this in array bracket format if you want. It would be int pointer bracket i times 2. Right? And that'll do the calculation for you. You'll see it this way a lot because you're, you're always thinking pointers, and you're just going to do it this way a lot. But you could use the bracket notation for arrays. Okay? So that's very good. So that's what that's going to print out. Now, here's where I think it starts to get a little interesting. Okay? The compiler knows how to add and multiply by the proper size type. Remember, how big are our ints? Four bytes. In memory, you get four bytes of space to put your integer. When you put the next integer, the compiler is going to have to say plus plus means, oh, I go four bytes ahead. One, two, three, four. The next integer goes there. See how that works? The compiler has to know that. It will know that. It will be able to figure that out for structs, for any other data types. It's cool that way. The compiler has to be able to figure that out in order to do it. So it's kind of neat. Okay? Why, does, why does it need to be that? Because there's these four byte integers. Okay. All right. Four-bit integers, the compiler figures it out for any types, including structs. Okay. Aha, let's dig in a little bit. OK. If you happen to use an IDE, like the Xcode for the Mac or whatever, you can get in there and you can say, hey, stop the program right here and look at the memory, lo the memory for that pointer. We're going to look at this and we're going to go, oh, OK. 
here's some addresses, and here's all the memory this points to. And you look at that and you go, what? <laughs> right? You go, wait a minute. I put 10 very, I put 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and it comes out with this garbage? Right? What is that? Well, we got to go into, we went into printf land, we got to go into hex land for a minute. Okay? These are hexadecimal, and you will generally see a lot of this in hexadecimal. There are very good reasons for making it hexadecimal, mainly because it's short, <laughs> right? The numbers are very short in general. Okay, and also because you're dealing with uh, base 2, which base 16 actually works very well with. Okay, but let's go into hex land for a minute. All right. So here's, by the way, this is what this means really. Okay. This, is the, uh, this left column here is the address. It's also in hexadecimal. Okay. In this case, it's, a hesimal, it's, it's the address 100203A10. This is 1, 0, this is 1, 1, this is 1, 2, this is 1, 3. It goes up by bytes. Okay, by the time you get around here, this should be up to 1C, which is, uh, let's see, C, we're going to talk about that in a second, but it goes A, B, C, so that's going to be 13. So 1, 2, uh, well, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, okay, 12. So A, B, C. A is 10, so 11, 12, you're right. Yep, so it's 12. OK, so anyway, this is just the address of where all these bytes are in memory. OK, well, hexadecimal means base 16. What's cool about hexadecimal is each hex digit is 16 bits long because there's 16, base 16. So you get 16 bits, which is two bytes. So if you're dealing with bytes, it's very nice in hexadecimal because each one of these it's two digits long, and it's one byte. So one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte. Nice. Okay. Two hex digits is 256 bits. All right. 16 bits long, or, or 16 bits is, uh, let's see, each, yeah, each hex digit is 16 bits long. Right. So 16, 16. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. 256 for each one of these guys. 256 for each little digit there. It's compact. That's one of the big reasons we use hex, because you can, you can like, write a lot, long number very succinctly. Okay? And it does take a little bit of getting used to. Why? Because there's these A, B, C, D, E, and Fs in there. Mm. Makes it a little tricky. But here's how it works. Just like you have digits 0 through 9 in decimal, you have 0 through 9 and then A, B, C, D, E, and F to go all the way up to 16. Treat them just like digits. They could have made them special little like star and curly symbol and whatever, but they just use letters because we already know those, right? And we kind of know the order of them too, which is nice. That's what they e equal in their decimal forms. Okay, so if I said F, that's decimal 15, hexadecimal F. Okay. Converting from decimal to hex, you've probably done this before in math classes and such. It's pretty straightforward. Divide by 16. The remainder is the least significant digit. I'm going to show you a couple examples here in a sec. And then the, what's, what the integer quotient that you had when you took out the remainder, you take that, divide by 16, the remainder there is the next hex digit. Okay? And you repeat until you have no more quotient. Pretty simple. And once you do it a few times, you go, oh, OK, this is easy. Here's, here's an example. 2,913 in decimal. Going to hexadecimal, it goes 2,913 divided by 16. You get 182 with one remainder. One is the least significant digit, the last one on your column of digits. Okay? And then you take 182 divided by 16, and you get a remainder of 6. That's your next digit. 11 divided by 16 gives you a remainder of 11. Well, there is no 11. Well, there is an 11 digit in hexadecimal. It happens to be B. So that's your next digit. And then we're done because we have no remainder. So 2,913 in decimal is B, 6, 1 in hexadecimal. So far, so good? Hopefully that's not too tricky. I'll do a slightly bigger example here in a sec. Okay. 43,981. Same thing. Divide by 16, divide by 16, divide by 16. Remainder, 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 remainder. They all happen to be the remainder first, first was 13. That's digit D. Remainder for 12, or the remainder for the next one is 12, C, and then 11, B, and then 10, A, and so on. So the decimal. Or the hex equivalent here, A, B, C, D. Straightforward stuff. You just have to remember that you've got the, the character, the extra digits. So why when we were looking at the hex table before, was it just 
two like either letters or numbers together to like two two and then four. Yeah, good question. So why was this? Whoops. Why was this? Two and two and two. Well, what it it breaks it up into 256, or, or breaks it up into um, one byte each. So one byte, one byte, one byte, one byte is what it is. Okay, one eight-bit byte. Is it eight? Did I get that wrong again? Uh, no, that is right. It's two. Mm, hang on. It's each one of these is yeah. Each one of these is a byte. That's 256. Yeah, different variables. So eight bits. You get eight bits for this. I think I might have written it down wrong here. But anyway, the point is, yes, so that's why they do it that way, because it's, it's a byte each time. So what if that, okay. that like, four numbers that are like zero, 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 zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll get to this. But that's one byte, two byte, three byte, four bytes. There's your integer. Remember how we put 0, 0 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 into this? There's your 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Guess what? This is your 10. This is your 20, et cetera. Okay, I'll show you why that's the case in a sec. Good question. Does that answer your question, Liza? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so we can go from hex to decimal to hex. Going backwards, it's simply about saying each hex digit is 16 times the power of 2 based on what digits it's at. It's just like doing, uh, if you want to figure out how much 422 in decimal is, you do, well, 423. You would do 3 times 10 to the 0 plus 2 times 10 to the 1 plus 4 times 10 to the 2, and that gives you 423. You, you do it that way. So same exact thing with going from hex to decimal, right? A, B, C, D, and hex. All right, first character is D. That's the lowest, the least significant bit, in other words, or least significant digit. In other words, it's not as important as the A in the, in the grand scheme of things for this number. That's the 16 to the 0th. Uh, character. So it's d times 16 to the 0, which is 13 times 1 is 13. Add that to c times 16 to the power 1, 12 times 16, you get 192. Add that to b times 16 squared, which is 11 times 256, you get 2816. a times 16 cubed, and you get 10, which is a, times 4096. Add them all together, you get 43981, which is what we had on the previous page. Okay. Not, not again. Not this is not rocket science. This is just, this is just learning how to do it the first couple of times and dealing with the fact that you've got weird characters in there. Okay. Questions on that? No. Okay. So let's go back to where we were. Yeah. Question, Hassan. Uh, like um, we will get into little Indian and Indian and big Indian in a minute. Yeah. Good question. We'll get into little ending in particular, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. Good question. Esan's prefacing something because it get, becomes important in about one second here. All right. Remember, when we were putting in our integers, they are int pointers, which are four bytes each. All right? Four bytes, 32 bits. 32 bits, four bytes. We, every time we increment it, it changes the address pointed to by the size of our integer. So here's the first integer we put in there. Here's the second integer we put in there. Notice it's 0a. Well, what did we say the character for 10 was, the, the hex digit for 10 was? It's a. So there's your a. OK, the there is no character digit for 20. But if you went and figured out that 14 in hex and turned it into decimal, you would get 20. And 1e in decimal gives you 30, et cetera, et cetera. OK? Each jump you go, you get to the next. One int pointer plus two gives you this one. The compiler knows. Question. Uh, so why is it the yeah, this is well. So this is exactly what S signs pointing to. Why is the leftmost one? Good question. Get to that in one sec. So careful. Hold on to that thought. Why is fourteen? Why does that equal twenty? And then why is 20, 30? Yeah, good question. So fourteen is one four. Is that so? Let's 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 step back one sec. 14 is less than 15. Why? Because 5 is bigger than 4, right? Because 7, 8, 9. No. Because 5 is, because 5 is bigger than 4, right? Um, so four, is 4 bigger or smaller than e? 
0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E. E is big. E, if 4 is smaller than E, so therefore 1, 4 is actually smaller than 1, E. Right? But what is 14 is in hex? 14 is in hex, yeah. right? And they're both in hex. This is in hex and this is in hex. And when you, when you multiply, when you divide, when you multiply 4 times, let's just do it, 4 times uh, 16 to the 0 is 4, right? OK. 1 times 16 to the first is 16, because 16 times 1, 16. 16 plus 4 is 20 in decimal. If you do the same thing here, you're going to get E, which is A, B, C, D, E. So that's going to be uh, 14, right? You're going to get, uh, you're going to get six, uh, 14 plus 20, which is, or 16, which is 30. Yeah, OK? So you can, you can do that. But anyway, the point is the compiler knows to jump this way. All right, back to your question, back to Esson's and uh, Marcus's question here, or comment. Take a look at this. So first of all, uh, right here we're looking at, uh, we said we were looking at 20, which is the third one that we put in there, 0, 1, 2. It's in space 2. But now we've got this weird situation where the 14 comes on the left side of these other three bytes here. OK, <clears throat> let, let, me, let, me, let me draw this. Let me draw something for you. This may, this may help. I haven't peeked under here. There might be something scandalous. Nope, somebody was nice. OK, so how do we normally do get a different, pen, different chalk? How do we normally do memory addresses? What's the lowest address on this side of the board or that side of the board? OK, this side's the lowest address, and this side 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. OK, let's say those are the, those are the addresses there, right? OK, in, in, the term, in terms of the numbers we are putting into memory, OK, you can arrange these four, like the four bytes, that, let's say these are four bytes here. You can arrange those any way you want, OK? Lowest memory to highest memory would be low, 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 lower, higher, 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 right? Lowest, higher, higher, higher. You get to pick which direction you actually put your numbers, OK? In this case, what the people who designed the computers we generally work on, x86 computers, Intel type chips or AMD type chips, right? They've decided that they are going to say that in a number, they're going to put the littlest part of the number the lowest in memory, which might make sense. In, the, in terms of the littlest part of the number 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4 is the 1, 4. And why is this the case? Why is it 0, 0, 0? Well, remember, our integers are four bytes long. We get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4. That's our, or 1, 4. That's our whole hexadecimal number. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4, right? That makes sense. This is just a, it's just a tiny little number because you get that many bytes to represent it in, right? You get four bytes to represent it in, OK? What they've said is they've said, let's put the one that's the least important, the lowest in memory. So they say the 14 goes here. The next one is this one, 0, 0. The next one's this one, 0, 0. The next one's this one, 0, 0. Now you've got it in memory in what we call little endian form. The little end goes first in memory. The reason it looks funny to us is because we normally don't read that way. Right? We, we look at memory locations going up generally, but we look at numbers going left to right as the little end, littlest end is on the right-hand side. Okay? If anybody speaks languages where they do things in reverse, is it better? That, would it be better this way? I don't know. I don't know if numbers are reversed like that. Yeah, question. Yes. In in memory, remember memory is all, here's the here's the biggest takeaway from Comp Forty. Memory is bits. So in bits, it's me, it's all located. It's like all the same. But you do have to. It is broken up by bytes. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so if you have the number FF, right, which is two hundred and fifty-five, and you add one to it, right, what's that going to become? Right, right now it's, oops, I did too many. 0000000FF zero, 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 plus 1 gives you what? What number would you get? Actually, I did that. Let me put it, put it in little endian form because that, 
I'll put it in little endian form so that, it, so that we are on the same page here. FF, 0, 0. OK. So FF and then FF plus 1 is what? 100, basically, because you get 1 and then this one goes over to the 0, 0, right? Well, what that would do is it would say it would put the uh, 0, 1 here and 0, 0 there, right? And it says 0, 1, 0, 0. And then, no, did I do that wrong? Sorry. It would say, nope, I lied. It would be, it would be this way. It would be 1. No, I, wait a minute. No, I, I did it right. Yeah, 0, 0, 0, 1. Right, and what that means is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. That's what it did. So it just added 1 and went that way with the number. Right, question. The least significant byte is the first one in the picture here, right? So when we, re when we added 1 to FF, we went FF goes to 1, 0, 0. Because we've, this really is 0 FF, right? And it goes to, right? And it's with all the other zeros on there. And then this is the, the lowest byte. And then the 0, 1 is the next one. So it's 0, 1, 0, 0, like that. OK? Question, Kian. Kind of, but by byte, right? So this first one you go, the first one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The second one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, A. The third one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4. So you have to do it by bytes because they're in, um, they're, well, they're by ints in this case because they're four byte integers. OK, yeah, so that is, OK. <clears throat> this is called little endian. Some computers do big endian. In terms of, it turns out, and that's not if you know this, correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe networking is generally big endian. So if you're going to copy a bunch of data across a network <clears throat> and you forget this little trick, sometimes the network will flip the bits around, or bytes around and they'll end up in the wrong order when they get there. And that's not good. <laughs> right? But you have, to, you have to deal with those same things. Remy? Uh, what's the benefit of the little world? You know what? It's no, there's no real benefit. I mean, it's just a, it's a design decision. And they just decided that way. And nobody standardized it way back when computers were first built. So they said, whatever you want. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You have to figure out some way to do it. And it's one of those two choices. And whichever one you choose is the way it goes. Yeah? Um, so when we have FF and we add one to it, the decimal number is 256, right? The decimal number is 256. Yeah, 16 is, yep. So how does 0, 0, 0, 1 end up being 256? Uh, OK, so this is, let's think about this in terms of the hex digits, right? This is 0 times 16 to the 0, 0 times 16 to the 1st, plus that 1 times 16 to the 2nd. 16 squared is 256. And then 0 times 16 to the 3rd, which is 0. So it's going to be 0 plus 256 plus 0 plus 0. Right? Maybe not. No? It, I tell you what, don't worry about the details of that yet. Go, go look at this up. Do some conversions. I'd be happy to chat with you about it before you get to COMP40. But yeah, it's, it's, it, the math takes a little bit of time to like wrap your head around, definitely. Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, yeah, no? I okay. just to know if you used if this If this number had been 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, well, zero, zero. Oh, 0010? Zero, zero, zero? OK. The 00, zero, it's really going to be 00010. Zero, 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 zero. So it would be 10000000. Zero, 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 zero. Right? It goes backwards. It's little end in. The little end comes first in memory. OK? <laughs> All right. Now, let's move on a little bit here. Uh, let's see. This, oh, we already did this. We already said this was 20. This is how we calculated it. OK, why is it 20? Because it's 1 times 16 to the first plus 4 times 16 to the 0 equals 20. You can also do all the other zeros in there if you want, but I'm not worried about all those. OK. So would the, on the next byte, would it go uh, 0 times 16 to the third plus 0 times 16 to the third? Yes. Yep. And then? Yep, exactly. Yeah, question. So Yes, and I should have been more clear about that. 
you read the bytes from you read the bytes from left to from right to left, and you read the and you read each individual byte normally as a text digit. Yeah, that's why that may be why you guys are getting a little confused. Chunk it into bit chunk it into into byte size chunks. Here's a byte. Here's a byte. Here's a byte. Here's a, oh that's kind of funny. Here's a byte. Here's a byte. Here's a byte. Here's a byte. Right? Okay. Byte, 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 byte. That is zero a. It's not a zero. It's not backwards like that. Yeah, very good comment. Yeah, I hadn't hadn't really thought of that. It's it's you have to think of it in bytes but backwards. Yeah, yeah. Which is another reason why they probably don't. Well, big endian doesn't doesn't really help you that much in this case. Well, it would I guess. It would probably be able to read it more like a number. Maybe they should have picked big endian. PowerPC did, but other other ones have not. Okay, so do we get though that we get when this is int pointer plus two says this is the first byte or the, the first integer, this is the second integer, that's the third integer at position two. Good? Okay, good. All right. Let's go back to a little bit more things here. Let's say that I stuck let's say that I stuck zero X B E E F. You can spell kind of fun words with hex sometimes too. In fact, Microsoft is famous for making a um, for in places in their memory where they want it to remain, they want to initialize it. They don't initialize it to null because that's always what everything gets initialized to, and you can't tell if it's been initialized. So what they initialize it to is the hexadecimal number D E A D B E E F, right? Dead. But there's some other ones too. Do you know the, there's some other ones too? I forget what the other ones are, but but what it, what it means is if you're looking at a picture like this. You can tell if the memory's been initialized because it said deadbeat, 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 right? Might be a little, that might be switched because of the endianness, but but you know that they've been initialized because they they throw that in there. So you know it's kind of fun. You can spell you know fun words like that. Well, no, but it's just it's generally for debugging in general. They leave some of those things in though, but yeah, you you can't use that in the program. Um, yeah, but it's uh, it's used for debugging generally to say hey, this whole section's been initialized or not. Okay. But anyway, if we put, and this, this should make this a little more apparent, if we put 0xbeef into location 8, that's here. Uh, no, sorry, that's here. 00beef. See how that's written out? It's this exactly what uh, we were talking about over here. 0000beef. If we do abcdef01, and by the way, this is how you make a hexadecimal number in C and C. It's a B C D E F zero one, A B C D E F zero one. That's how that one's in memory. Uh, does look a little ugly, but you got to start reading it like that if you know that this is an integer. Wait till you get into floating point stuff in Comp forty. Totally, I mean, totally same stuff. It's just numbers are like this long, and it's kind of ugly. But but you get how that you get how that actually works, right? At this point. Okay. All right. We did talk a little bit about, so we, we did a little on hexadecimal. We talked a little bit about binary earlier in the semester. I, may, I made a point to like just add binary numbers together, right? And it had, to, it had to do with trees and the fact that we always do log base two and all that. Well, computers, are, they deal with bits. Everything's a bit stream. Everything's a, or everything's a bit representation. But you can't address things in bits. You can only address them in bytes. Why makes the hardware easier? I mean, there's, there doesn't make any sense to try to individually say, you're at this location and then one bit over, you're at this location and one bit over. The numbers would get too big and it would get too, too um, it would be slow, really. If you go by bytes, you do that. This is why bytes exist, right? It was so that you had a chunk of, uh, a reasonable chunk to like increment by in memory. That was, the, that was one of the big reasons they used bytes to begin with. You do have to do bitwise calculations. Okay? Bitwise calc I'm not going to go into the detail. They, they spend lots of time in, in uh, Comp 40 on this. But if you have 1010 and you OR it with 0111, right? You do it bitwise. You each individually bit, each individual bit like this. You do, let's see, 1 and 0, OR is 1, 1. They're both one, so that's one and one, like that. That or with that gives you one, 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 right? It's a bitwise or pattern. How do you do that in C? In C, you say something like A or B. Normally, we do two of these guys for for like logical or. 
if you're doing bitwise or it would be A or B like with one. And that tends to, you forget that all the time. The compiler is normally pretty good about telling you that. But that's how you would do an or bitwise. You have to know how to do some of those bitwise calculations. You will learn all about those. Sam? Is that a calculation? So I, I could say C equals A or B? You can, yes. Yep. If you said C equals A or B and A was 1, 0, 1, 0 and B was 0, 1, 1, 1, the answer would be 1, 1, 1, 1. Yep. It's a logic, or it's it's a bitwise calculation, not a logical calculation. Okay. I mean, it's logical per bit, but that's it. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about just a tiny little bit on binary. Same process as doing as doing hexadecimal, right? What do you do? You divide by twos instead of sixteens, and you take the remainder. Turns out this is a little more involved because the numbers are bigger, right? You're only dividing by two instead of sixteen. Right? So 23 divided by 2 gives you, if we're doing 23, it gives you 11 with the remainder of 1, the least significant bits of 1. 11 divided by 2, which is the, the quotient, is 5 with a remainder of 1. And you're always going to get a remainder of either 1 or 0 when you're dividing by 2. Right? I mean, that's kind of the point of binary. You're, the only digits are 0 and 1. That's it. So when you get these, so you keep doing the division, division, division. When you get to 0, you're done. You read it off this way 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Is, sorry, you read it out the other way. 10111 is the binary representation of 23. Going backwards, exactly the same thing. 1 times 2 to the 0th plus 1 times 2 to the 1st plus 1 times 2 to the 2nd plus 0 times 2 to the 3rd plus 1 times 2 to the 4th. Add them all together, that's your answer. Why do we think binary is not so fun? Oh, that's the same thing. I just did that, adding them all up. Binary is not so great. Because it's verbose. You end up with really big numbers. Right? Five million in decimal is this big in binary. Right? It's beautiful. Right? It's it's beautiful, but it's like it's it's beautiful, but it's like long. Right? Don't get me started on uh, base one, but it's just a bunch of ones. No, there's only one digit. One is one one, two is two ones, three is three ones. Numbers get really long. Five million is five million ones. Um, so anyway, so this is base two, and it's, the numbers get really long. It's not too fun to do these calculations. You will do a lot of this stuff. You'll do what's called bit packing a lot in, in Comp 40, which means, which means take numbers and, or take two, like bytes, and cram them into a smaller amount of space than what they no, more normally would take, because you can say something special about them. Like for instance, right back here, well, if we had byte pa bit packed these things, well, nobody, none of these use the second, third, like the second, third, or fourth uh, parts. So we could have put it, made it go 0a, 1, 4, 1, e. And when you unpack them, it expands back out. So you have to do stuff like that, which is fun stuff. Okay. Here's why one of the big reasons we use hexadecimal. Converting between binary and hexadecimal is like dead easy, dead beef easy. Right? It's easy, right? Going from each hexadecimal digit is equivalent, because it's 16 bits, is equivalent to, is equivalent to, or sorry, yeah, it's, it's, sorry, it's not. Each hexadecimal digit is equivalent to four bits in the bit stream here, okay? Because it's 16, uh, it goes up to 16 digits long, okay? So if you are converting from, Let's say 111, right, is 7. It's in 7 in both decimal and hexadecimal. But you can go all the way up to 16 before you have to get to a fifth binary digit. Okay, so it's very nice that way. If you're converting 5 million into hex, well, you look at them in chunks of fours again, right? These four bits, 100 is 4. So that's the first one. 4 is the first hex digit. 1100 is C, C. 0, 1, 0, 0 is, 0, 1, 0, 0 is, uh, again, 4, right? 4. And then B, and then 4 again, and then 0. So easy to convert back and forth. Okay. Yeah, question? Can you tell if that was being stored in the logical description, where it would be 0, 0, 4, 0, 4, B, 4, B? Let me, let me think. If it was, well, OK, it depends on, so we've got, 
So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six bytes here, which is probably not the best example, because normally you do them in eight bytes or, or four bytes or whatever. But you would have, it would, if, if they were integers, they would still be stored in that little endian nature, yeah, in that, in that little endian form, depending on what type you're actually dealing with. This would, be, this would probably be in a, uh, let's see, one, well, one, two, three, probably be a four byte in. So you have one more set of zero, zero before that. Zero, zero back up here. Yeah. Question, Remy? Where's the what? Oh, that just means binary. Yeah, that's one way. One of the ways we designate it as being binary, a binary number. Because you could write this as a decimal number, right? You don't know if it's decimal until you see that bit. You could also write this as a hexadecimal if you wanted to. We normally use hexadecimal as zero x before it. Okay. All right. So that's how you that's how you go from binary to hex. Um, you ever ever looked at your uh, uh, IP address is not a good example. Ever looked at your uh, MAC address for your computer? Your MAC address is generally in hex digits, and it's because they, they have all the different, like it could be one big long stream of a number, but they, they pack it into hex digits so that it's much shorter than the equivalent binary or decimal. Okay. All right, so we are finally to the end of my little, like, what you need to know in Comp40. There's a bunch of references here. This is the one from the Comp40 webpage, so please go look at that one. Questions, other questions about it. Do not let it scare you, by the way. You will, you will, have, you will have a good time in Comp40. Okay? I mean, you, you really will. You'll, you'll at the, at, trust me, I've asked, this whole semester, I've asked kind of people who I know who are in Comp40 now, and they're like, oh, yeah, I haven't slept in three weeks. But, but then they go, oh, it's still a good class. <laughs> right? So, you know, I mean, they, they love it. One, one, one TA, she said, she went home, and her roommates were like, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> she had, like, the night off. And she's like, oh. But anyway, you'll, you'll see a lot of, like, you'll, You'll be in Halligan a lot, let's say. But I think when you get done with it, you'll, you'll be very happy you did it. Questions on that? All right, guys. We'll see you later. Yeah. It depends on your TA when the time stops coming out. But uh, it depends on your, well, kind of depends on TA. I'm, the Monday lab from this week is next week, yeah. Is that what you expect to do that? Not necessarily. You, I want you to be working on your projects then, but you might do that. You might have time to do that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, 